The program is also raising national awareness of the services that forests provide. On the other side of the world, in Niger, farmers faced with severe drought and desertification in the 1980s began leaving some emerging acacia tree seedlings in their fields as they prepared the land for crops. As these trees matured they slowed wind speeds, thus reducing soil erosion. The acacia, a legume, fixes nitrogen, thus enriching the soil and helping to raise crop yields. During the dry season the leaves and pods provide fodder for livestock. The trees also supply firewood. This approach of leaving 20-150 seedlings per hectare to mature on some 3 million hectares has revitalized farming communities in Niger. Assuming an average of 40 trees per hectare each maturity, this comes to 120 million trees. This practice also has been central to reclaiming 250,000 hectares of abandoned land. The key to this success story was the shift in tree ownership from the state to individual farmers, giving them the responsibility for protecting the trees. Shifting some cities from building logging roads to planting trees would help protect forest cover worldwide. The World Bank has the administrative capacity to lead an international program that would emulate South Korea's success in blanketing mountains and hills with trees. In addition, FAO and the bilateral aid agencies can work with individual farmers and national agroforestry programs to integrate trees wherever possible into agricultural operations. Well-chosen, well-placed trees provide shade, serve as windbreaks to check soil erosion, and can fix nitrogen, reducing the need for fertilizer. Reducing wood use by developing more efficient wood stoves and alternative cooking fuels, systematically recycling paper, and banning the use of throwaway paper products or light and pressure on the Earth's forests. But a global reforestation effort cannot succeed, unless it is accompanied by the stabilization of population. With such an integrated plan, coordinated country by country, the Earth's forests can be restored. Conserving and rebuilding soils. In reviewing the literature on soil erosion, references to the loss of protective vegetation occur again and again. Over the last half century, we have removed so much of that protective cover by clear cutting, overgrazing, and overplowing that we are fast losing soil accumulated over long stretches of geological time. Preserving the biological productivity of highly erodible cropland depends on planting it in grass, or trees before it becomes wasteland. The 1930s Dust Bowl, that threatened to turn the U.S. Great Plains into a vast desert, was a traumatic experience, that led to revolutionary changes in American agricultural practices, including the planting of tree sheltered books, rows of trees planted beside fields to slow wind, and thus reduce wind erosion, and strip cropping, the planting of wheat on alternate strips with fallowed land each year. Strip cropping permits soil moisture to accumulate on the fallowed strips, while the alternating planted strips reduce wind speed, and hence erosion on the idled land. In 1985, the U.S. Congress, with strong support from the environmental community, created the Conservation Reserve Program, CRP to reduce soil erosion and control over production of basic commodities. By 1990 there were some 14 million hectares, 35 million acres, of highly erodible land with permanent vegetative cover under 10-year contracts. Under this program, farmers were paid to plant fragile cropland to grass or trees. The retirement of 14 million hectares under the CRP together with the use of conservation practices on 37% of all cropland, reduced U.S. soil erosion from 3.1 billion tons to 1.9 billion tons during the 15 years between 1982 and 1997. The U.S. approach offers a model for the rest of the world. Another tool in the soil conservation toolkit, and a relatively new one is conservation tillage, which includes both no-till and minimum tillage, Instead of the traditional cultural practices of plowing land, dissing or harrowing it to prepare the seed bed, and then using a mechanical cultivator to control weeds in row crops, 
Farmers simply drill seeds directly through crop residues into undisturbed soil, controlling weeds with herbicides. The only soil disturbance is the narrow slit in the soil surface, where the seeds are inserted, leaving the remainder of the soil undisturbed, covered by crop residues, and thus resistant to both water and wind erosion. In addition to reducing erosion, this practice helps retain water, raises soil carbon content, and reduces energy use. In the United States, where farmers during the 1990s were required to implement a soil conservation plan on ruddable cropland, to be eligible for commodity price supports, the no-till area went from 7 million hectares in 1990 to 25 million hectares in 2004. Now widely used in the production of corn and soybeans, no-till has spread rapidly in the Western Hemisphere, covering 25 million hectares in 2006 in Brazil, 20 million hectares in Argentina, and 13 million in Canada. Australia, with 9 million hectares, rounds out the five leading no-till countries. Once farmers master the practice of no-till, its use can spread rapidly particularly if governments provide economic incentives or acquire farm soil conservation plans for farmers to be eligible for crop subsidies. Recent FAO reports describe the early growth in no-till farming over the last few years in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Other approaches are being used to halt soil erosion and desert encroachment on cropland. Algeria, trying to halt the northward advance of the Sahara Desert announced in December 2000 that it was concentrating its orchards and vineyards in the southern part of the country, hoping that these perennial plantings will halt the desertification of its cropland. In July 2005, the Moroccan government, responding to severe drought, announced that it was allocating $778 million to cancel farmers' debts and to convert cereal-planted areas into less vulnerable olive and fruit orchards. Sub-Saharan Africa faces a similar situation, with the desert moving southward all across the Sahel, from Senegal on the west coast to Djibouti on the east coast. Countries are concerned about the growing displacement of people as grasslands and croplands turn to desert. As a result, the African Union has launched the Green War Sahara Initiative. This plan, originally proposed by Olius Kanaba Sanjo, when he was president of Nigeria, calls for the planting of 300 million trees on 3 million hectares of land, in a long band stretching across Africa. Senegal, which is currently losing 50,000 hectares of productive land each year, would anchor the green wall on the western end. Senegal's environment minister Modi Fadadine says, Instead of waiting for the desert to come to us, we need to attack it. Quote, China is likewise planting a belt of trees to protect land from the expanding Gobi Desert. This Green Wall, a modern version of the Great Wall, is projected to reach some 4,480 kilometers (2,800 miles) in length, stretching from outer Beijing through Inner Mongolia. In addition to its Great Green Wall China is paying farmers in the threatened provinces to plant their cropland in trees. The goal is to plant trees on 10 million hectares of grain land, easily one-tenth of China's current grain land area. In Inner Mongolia, near Mongol, efforts to halt the advancing desert and to reclaim the land for productive uses rely on planting desert shrubs to stabilize the sand dunes. And in many situations, Sheep and goats have been banned entirely. In Helen County, south of the provincial capital of Hohat, the planting of desert shrubs on abandoned cropland has now stabilized the soil on the county's first 7,000 hectare reclamation plot. Based on this success, the reclamation effort is being expanded. The Helen County Strategy centers on replacing the large number of sheep and goats with dairy cattle increasing the number of dairy animals from 30,000 in 2002 to 150,000 by 2007. The cattle are kept within restricted areas, feeding on corn stalks, wheat straw, and the harvest from a drought-tolerant forage crop resembling alfalfa, 
which is grown on reclaimed land. Local officials estimate that this program will double incomes within the county during this decade. To relieve pressure on the country's rangelands, Beijing is asking herders to reduce their flocks of sheep and goats by 40%. But in communities where wealth is measured in livestock numbers, and where most families are living in poverty, such cuts are not easy, or, indeed, likely, unless alternative livelihoods are offered to pastoralists along the lines proposed in Helen County. The only viable way to eliminate overgrazing on the two-fifths of the Earth's land surface classified as rangelands is to reduce the size of flocks and herds. Not only do the excessive numbers of cattle, and particularly sheep and goats, remove the vegetation, but their hoofs pulverize the protective crust of soil that is formed by rainfall and that naturally checks wind erosion. In some situations, the only viable option is to keep the animals in restricted areas, bringing the forage to them. India, which has successfully adopted this practice for its thriving dairy industry, is the model for other countries. Protecting the earth's soil also warrants a worldwide ban on the clear-cutting of forests in favor of selective harvesting, simply because with each clear cut there are heavy soil losses until the forest regenerates. Thus with each subsequent cutting, productivity declines further. Restoring the earth's tree and grass cover, as well as practicing conservation agriculture, protects soil from erosion, reduces flooding, and sequesters carbon. It is one way we can restore the earth, so that it can support the next generation. Regenerating fisheries for decades governments tried to save specific fisheries, by restricting the catch of individual species. Sometimes this worked, sometimes it failed and fisheries collapsed. In recent years, support for another approach the creation of marine reserves, or marine parks has been gaining momentum. These reserves, where fishing is restricted, serve as natural hatcheries helping to repopulate the surrounding area. In 2002, at the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, coastal nations pledged to create national networks of marine parks, which together could constitute a global network of such parks. At the World Parks Congress in Durban in 2003, delegates recommended protecting 20-30% of each marine habitat from fishing. This would be up from 0.6% of the oceans that are currently included in marine reserves of widely varying size. It compares with the nearly 13% of the Earth's land area that is in parks. A UK team of scientists led by Dr. Andrew Barnford of the Conservation Science Group at Cambridge University analyzed the costs of operating marine reserves on a large scale based on data from 83 relatively small well-managed reserves. They concluded that managing reserves that covered 30% of the world's oceans would cost $12.14 billion a year. This did not take into account the likely additional income from recovering fisheries, which would reduce the actual cost. At stake in the creation of a global network of marine reserves is the protection and possible increase of an annual oceanic fish catch worth $70.80 billion. Barnford said, our study suggests that we could afford to conserve the seas and their resources in perpetuity, and for less than we are now spending on subsidies to exploit them unsustainably. Co-author of the UK study, Callum Roberts of the University of York, noted, we have barely even begun the task of creating marine parks. Here in Britain a paltry one-fiftieth of one percent of our seas is encompassed by marine nature reserves and only one-fiftieth of their combined area is close to fishing. Still the seas are being devastated by unsustainable fishing, pollution, and mineral exploitation. The creation of the global network of marine reserves serengetis of the seas, as some have dubbed them would create more than one million jobs. Roberts went on to say, if you put areas off limits to fishing, there is no more effective way of allowing things to live longer grow larger, and produce more offspring. Jane Labchenko, 
former president of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, strongly underlined Robert's point when releasing a statement signed by 161 leading marine scientists calling for urgent action.